a world of darkness for months on end. Or a life of relentless sunshine and clear blue skies. What draws people to live in some of the most extreme conditions on our planet? Those that do need to be tough and resilient, unfazed by eternal night or a world shrouded in mist and fog. This is the story of human resilience and technical ingenuity of those living in some of the most extreme places on Earth. The sunniest town in the world lies in a North American desert. The darkest is found on the Arctic islands of Svalbard and surprisingly in a small village in Italy. And the foggiest place on Earth is Newfoundland off the east coast of Canada. Svalbard or Spitsbergen is the northernmost part of Norway, located far above the Arctic Circle. Its capital, Longyearbyen, is only 800 kilometers from the pole. It's the most northerly town in the world. The polar night here lasts for two and a half months. From October till February, the sun never appears above the horizon, and the islanders are faced with continuous darkness and bitter cold. In the 17th and 18th centuries, the islands were used as a whaling base. Then, a hundred years ago, rich coal deposits were found. Longyearbyen was the first mining town on the island. Today, it's the largest settlement and has over 2,000 inhabitants. If you work here in winter, you're on permanent night shift. An early morning in January. For the locals, as elsewhere in the world, time for the school run and the weekly shop. The town's old coal mines are no longer in use today. They're merely a tourist attraction in summer, and in winter, they lie deserted. Coal is still extracted on Svalbard, but the working mines are now 60 kilometers further south. There are few roads on the island, so the best way to get about is by snowmobile. For most of the 20th century, the main reason for traveling to Svalbard was for its coal. Scandinavia had few reserves of the precious fossil fuel, and Svalbard was close enough to be an attractive source. Even today, over one and a half million tons are extracted each year, most of it exported to Europe. Change of shift at the mine, from one night shift to the next. Working conditions here are tough, even if in winter it's as dark above ground as below. The pit extends for miles underground. The noise is deafening and the headlamps shed little light. Most workers don't stay here for longer than two to five years. Linda Norberg is one of 200 women working in the mines. She's been here for nine years now. The unusual lifestyle and the darkness seem to suit her. What is it that enticed her to stay so long in this distant and bleak part of the world? I think it's cozy. We can have some candles and it's just lovely when it's dark all the time. I don't know, maybe I'm a dark person. <coughs> Not. <laughs> 
Despite the darkness and the grime, Linda always wears makeup to work. When she surfaces again, there will be little sign of her efforts. So what brought her to Svalbard in the first place? Yeah, when I came up here, I have decided I wanted a Norwegian boy. And I find him up here. That was different. And I, I didn't know what Spitsbergen was. Uh, but it was a lot of guys to choose from up here in the beginning. But I think I got the best one and he's also working inside the mine. And uh, yeah, when I stayed in Longyearbyen for six years, we worked seven days on and seven days off. I had no problem. It was just everybody so polite and really nice and you get a lot of friends in Longyearbyen. So it's, uh, it's no problem. For the miners, the end of a shift is usually marked with a drink at the bar. It's the center of social life and a good place for company during the dark days and nights. Alcohol and tobacco are duty-free and relatively cheap. It's one of the perks of living here. But walking home at night can be dangerous. This is polar bear territory. Sunday, January 15th. A bear has been spotted just outside Long Yebian. Svalbard has two and a half thousand human inhabitants and three and a half thousand polar bears. Bear attacks are rare but can be fatal. Per Andreasen is Long Yebian's police chief. Yes, I got this uh, call from a guide that has spotted a uh, uh, polar bear in the valley and uh, I drove up here and uh, stopped and then I saw the polar bear on the opposite side and coming uh, towards me uh, quite fast and uh, then I decided to use my flare gun to uh, try to scare it away but then I uh, have to hit it because uh, the distance was so uh, so narrow and the flare gun has a reach for about uh, 100 meters so uh, if I didn't hit it I could, could get the opposite uh, effect that I wanted so but luckily I hit the uh, polar bear in the chest and uh, the bang got off and he turned around and uh, went up in the valley. Until 20 years ago, Svalbard was pretty inaccessible for tourists. An airport and regular scheduled flights were only introduced in the 1970s. One of the first women to settle here was Freya Hutzschenreuter from Germany. She'd been fascinated by the Arctic since childhood and first came here in 1968. Also I don't want people to think that I only headed north because that's all I've ever seen. I do have a photo of myself under a palm tree, and that's good. The palm tree can stay where it is, as long as it's not in my way when I drive my skidoo. Freya doesn't have a telephone, and she doesn't want one. She likes writing letters, and as a result, she also gets lots of mail. A daily routine each morning is to check her post box. There are not many older people living in Svalbard, but Freya doesn't feel lonely. She's used to her own company. Long Yebien only has two main roads and few side streets, so even in the dark one always bumps into friends and acquaintances. Mm 
wenn schöne Wintertage sind. On clear winter nights, we might get the northern lights or a beautiful moon or the stars. And when the weather is bad, well, bad weather is also good. It's good for the soul because it gives you something to complain about. Freya's cheerful disposition helps her cope with the harsh conditions up here. But Svalbard's freezing winters and continuous darkness wouldn't be everyone's cup of tea. Those who enjoy warmth and sunshine are better off heading for Yuma in Arizona, the sunniest place on Earth. Yuma prides itself on clear blue skies and no clouds for 340 days of the year. Quartzite lies just north of Yuma. In summer, it has a population of two and a half thousand, but in winter, this grows to over a million. The small desert town is a popular winter destination for people seeking sunshine during the coldest months of the year. Spend the time. Many of the sun seekers are pensioners with time on their hands. But during the heat of the day, they often seek entertainment inside. Oh, it all started with a little bit of kiss and a hug. That a little bit of genuine thing they call the love bug. Quartzite offers them a whole way of life, and many stay for six months of the year, turning this small community into Arizona's second largest city. Despite the sunshine, few people are out and about during the day. The city park and playground are deserted, but not because of venomous snakes. More than half the population of Quartzite is over 65 years old. The town center is the biggest mobile home and RV showcase in the world, they come from all corners of the United States, every make and model and in all shapes and sizes. Quartzite has been called the Woodstock for RVers. And to accommodate them all, a seemingly endless number of RV parks. Peggy Knapp and her partner had been looking for their dream retirement home for some time. In the end, they decided on Quartzite, mainly because of the sunshine. We moved to Idaho, and we lived there 10 years, and uh, some of the winter times for three months in a row, we wouldn't even see the sun. So we got kind of down with that and we decided to move in the desert, back in the desert, and came here to Quartzsite and we've been here ever since. Although everyone claims to come here for the sunshine, the streets are surprisingly empty of life during the day. The only activity seems to be on the golf course. The famous Quartzsite Masters is held here every year on the last Saturday of February. But this is no ordinary tournament. This is desert golf. It was invented several years ago as a bit of fun, and it takes place a few miles outside of town. It quickly became a major attraction. It's also called tough golf, and for good reason. It's definitely a challenge if you're used to putting on green grass. 
armed with sunglasses and sun hats, it's all about avoiding the thorny bushes and cacti. Like all tourist enclaves, Quartzsite has no shortage of shops. And most visitors ensure they make at least one pit stop at Paul Weiner's bookstore. Paul is best known for his unconventional appearance as he goes about his daily work. The lean, suntanned bookseller has been nude for most of his life. It's become his trademark, and it doesn't seem to deter his customers. On the contrary, the naked bookstore owner has become a bit of a local legend. When I was a teenager, young teenager, I did not like the feeling of clothing rubbing on me. My skin was hyper, hyper, hypersensitive. When I wear clothing, I feel it moving on me all the time I'm wearing it. It's, it's, it's like being in a costume. You're aware of the clothing on you all the time you're in a costume. So I used to be as naked as possible given the weather, the circumstances, ever since I was a kid. Once I was an adult, I went to a nudist park once and discovered it was so boring, I left. <laughs> this eccentric 68-year-old was once a boogie-woogie pianist and still occasionally entertains visitors in his store. Without a doubt, he's one of Quartzsite's most iconic figures. Quartzsite and Yuma owe their sunny climate to the surrounding desert. Svalbard's winter darkness is entirely due to its northerly position. But a small village in northern Italy is steeped in darkness for a more unusual reason. Viganella lies at the bottom of a steep-sided alpine valley. Every year from mid-November, the sun disappears behind the mountains and remains unseen for three long months. For most of the winter, the inhabitants of Viganella are condemned to living in the shadows of the mountains. The gloomy cold has profoundly affected the lives of the villagers. Most young people have moved away and there is now no school, and no work. Sergio Bionda is one of the few still trying to hold on to family traditions. He was born in Viganella and has lived here all his life. He's determined to stay and continue to care for his goats. But there are few in this valley still prepared to farm the land as Sergio once did, and the local community is a dying one. Unlike the inhabitants of Svalbard, who are free to come and go as they please, the residents of Viganella are trapped. To escape the depressing gloom of their valley, they have to leave their home and abandon their land. <laughs> In winter, when the snow falls, we always stay indoors. There isn't much to do here, and with no sunshine it gets very cold, so we stay at home. But in 2006, the local mayor came up with an idea to help the villagers out of their misery. He mounted a giant mirror on the mountain top above the village to reflect the sunlight down into the main piazza, flooding the once dark village square with bright light. It was an ingenious solution to a long-standing problem, a spot that had not seen the sun's rays all winter since the beginning of time was now suddenly bathed in glorious warm sunshine. Pierre Franco Midali, the resourceful mayor, had achieved the seemingly impossible and given the villagers new hope.
The idea was hatched during a friendly wager between two friends. We believe that light and warmth are crucial for all life. Our plan was to bring sunshine to the village square so that everyone can come together and enjoy themselves. This is a place which has never seen any sunlight from the 11th of November to the 2nd of February, simply because of the mountains. The gigantic mirror is controlled by a computer that tracks the sun and turns the reflector as needed. So the sun's rays can be directed not just into the village square, but also into someone's house or garden for a special event. It's well known that long periods of cold and darkness can have a negative effect on a person's mood, causing what is commonly known as winter blues. And none are more acutely aware of this than the inhabitants of an island off the east coast of Canada, Newfoundland. The Avalon Peninsula is the eastern tip of the island, and the small village of St. Schott's is known as the foggiest place in the world. 400 years ago, this was one of the first places in North America to be colonized by European settlers. Today, it's a very different story. St. Schott's has no more than 80 residents and its population is shrinking. Young people are leaving this coastal community for the same reasons as those in Viganella. The Avalon Peninsula is nearly always covered in a blanket of fog. The cold Labrador current from the north meets the warm Gulf Stream, creating a thick sea mist almost every day. Avalon is also a mythical island featured in the legends of King Arthur. Only those with the power to summon the holy bark could find their way through the dense fog to reach the island. Today it's a foghorn that leads the way through the mist. Each horn has a unique frequency and its own keeper. The horn blasts every 60 seconds, day and night, sometimes for weeks on end. Foghorn keeper Basil Malloy used to be a fisherman, but the fish stocks in the seas around Newfoundland have been wiped out by centuries of overfishing. St. Schatz was a fishing community and fishermen fished in open boats uh, with a compass for navigating and uh, when you get out to sea we sometimes get strong tides to run probably north or south there and especially spring tides uh, and to find your find your way back in and to get back into port without a foghorn would be probably almost impossible especially if there's a bit of rough weather if you can't get close enough to land to see a landmark the foghorn was a godsend. And none more so than the foghorn and lighthouse of Cape Race. The coast around here is known as the graveyard of the Atlantic. Hundreds of ships litter the seabed after falling victim to the dangerous cliffs and the impenetrable fog. The Anglo-Saxon is one of them. She sank here in 1863, taking with her 237 lives. But the most famous tragedy associated with Cape Race is that of the ill-fated ocean liner, the Titanic. On the 15th of April 1912, the lighthouse received a distress call. The huge passenger ship was in trouble some 600 kilometers away. The Titanic had hit an iceberg. The wireless operator at Cape Race tried to coordinate a rescue, but it was too late. Within hours, the mighty ship had sunk, taking 1,500 souls with her.
Modern GPS systems make traveling through fog less dangerous. Conrad Myrick is one of the last fishermen here who still takes out his boat, more out of habit than to earn a living. But even he is not immune to the permanent fog. After a week, he's had enough of the thick mist across the water. In the days when fish were still abundant here, Conrad would rise at three in the morning and spend the entire day out at sea. It was a hard life and fraught with dangers. He still remembers one treacherous and foggy day when a small mistake by his partner nearly cost them their lives. Visibility was so poor that they had to rely on a compass to guide them through the murky haze. So he laid his compass on the engine house and that was the mistake he made he never did do it before and the exhaust from the from the engine was coming up and it dried the compass so he took a course from the compass where he had it and then he laid it down where he always had it so we went on and he was trying to impress me to make how good a shot he could make it a land right so when we went, the next thing we see, nothing on the white water ahead, and he wheeled around, we got out of it. It had frightened the life out of him, and I was nearly too young to uh, get a fright. But I did get a fright too. He never talked till we got in. And when we got in, he said, that must be Hazel Cole. That was way down below St. Chats. Hazardous seas that once had the best fishing in the North Atlantic. When the mist and fog finally lift, they reveal the beauty of the coastline and also evidence of the countless tragedies that have occurred here. When the air clears and the skies turn blue, everyone in St. Schott's uses the precious time to open doors and hang out the washing. A couple of hours later, and it's all over. The fog creeps back in from the sea, and the cliffs are swathed once again in a white shroud. Cliff Doran is the lighthouse keeper's assistant. He also looks after the helipad and the weather station. But whenever there's time, and weather permitting, he lights up the barbecue. I've been here for up to oh, around 56 days, and we've had nothing but fog. You get up in the morning, and it's thick of fog. You go to bed at night, it's thick of fog. It's all you can hear is the alarm going off. You can hear cars. The, the road is approximately about 50 feet from the house. And you can hear the cars, but you cannot see them. So this is, that's the way it is. After a while, it, it gets pretty boring. So Cliff finds ways of keeping up his spirits. He uses every opportunity to invite friends over for a picnic. Hello, what are you cooking today? Ah, oh, we have uh, burgers on this evening. That's good then. Where elsewhere such activities are reserved for sunny days, the people of St. Schott's have learned to enjoy a barbecue whatever the weather, which usually means surrounded by walls of fog. The fog don't seem to be very thick down along there. Seven thousand kilometers south, barbecues are also being lit. But in quartzite, mist and fog are quite unheard of. 
And retired pensioners are not the only ones here pursuing the sun. Fifty kilometers outside town, they've begun to build the largest solar power plant in the world. Rows of parabolic reflectors will pierce skywards to focus the sun's rays onto a central collector. It's the first time that solar energy will be harnessed on such a huge scale. The Blythe Solar Power Project is a massive multi-billion dollar operation and it should generate energy comparable to nuclear and conventional power stations. The aim is to provide electricity to over 300,000 American households. And where better to exploit the energy from the sun than here, in the sunniest place on Earth? We are here north of Yuma in the desert in Arizona. We're here on the site of the world's first solar tower, which will look like this. It's going to be built right out here in the desert in this area. And essentially the tower itself is a concrete structure. It's about 2,600 feet tall, which is about twice as tall as the Empire State Building. The diameter of the structure is about 300 feet and it'll be circled by a glass greenhouse. Uh, the, the glass itself will have a diameter of about three miles. Uh, we call it the collector. And uh, the heat that's generated underneath this glass roof will actually be drawn up through the tower and turn some turbines generating approximately 200 megawatts of power. But not everybody here is excited by the ambitious project. The massive power plant is being built on land that is sacred and spiritual to the Native American Indians. They're not opposed to solar energy, but they are also not prepared to let it destroy their ancient heritage. The cause of their concern are these gigantic figures engraved in the ground. They're so immense, they're best seen from the air and 75-year-old Alfredo Figuero is leading the campaign to save them. This area here is very sacred to us and to everybody. But our ancestors were the ones that made these designs here. These are geoglyphs and these designs represent the humans, Cocopili and Sisimit. Sisimit is the spirit of the human Cocopili. And the solar power companies are trying to place a 9,500 acre site here of those panels and, and they will destroy the pristine desert and also the sacred sites. That's why we're here. We've been uh, uh, fighting all this time and so we want to continue. We're going to continue to make sure that these solar power projects are not placed on the pristine desert or the, much less the sacred sites. For thousands of years, the sun has shaped the deserts and preserved the ancient sculptures created by the Native Americans. Now things are changing and man is trying to steer and control the power of the sun, for better or for worse. Many of mankind's technological achievements are based on an age-old desire to master the elements. And one such dream has long been the yearning to take to the air. Clear blue skies and no wind are perfect conditions for flying. And there is no shortage of days like this in the sunniest place on Earth. Model aircraft enthusiasts congregate here, taking advantage of the reliably good weather. During the Second World War, the U.S. Air Force opened a strategic base here. 
This was closed down again once the war was over. But some of Yuma's residents wanted to persuade the government to keep the airbase open. And they tried to gain publicity with an aerial endurance stunt. The event attracted worldwide attention. A local car dealer and an electrician would try to stay in the air continuously for six weeks without landing. The plane was fueled in flight from a moving car. The duo succeeded and covered nearly 150,000 kilometers. Shirley Murdoch's brother was one of them. When my brother told me I'm going to fly and not land for six weeks, I thought, first of all, I thought it was impossible because I hadn't been aware of others having done that. And secondly, I thought it was kind of strange. Why would anybody want to do that? Well, the reason is to show, to brag about our good weather. We have to show the world that we have good flying weather. So I was kind of skeptical, not frightened, just kind of thinking it was a strange idea. The extraordinary feat by these two young men put Yuma firmly on the map. A few years later, the military airbase also reopened. Whether that was down to the spectacular stunt or the famous good weather, we shall never know. But the highlight of the show, a kiss in mid-flight, will not be quickly forgotten. Even today, Yuma's skies are filled with the sound of helicopters, passenger planes, and military jets. Yuma lies close to the Mexican border, one of the most heavily guarded in the world. Every square kilometer is monitored closely, day and night. To evade the rigorous ground patrols, drug traffickers have turned the good weather to their advantage and taken to the air. Most recently, we've seen an increase in the use of ultralight aircraft, which is a very small aircraft uh, that they use to travel into the United States. Most frequently, they, they try to drop the narcotics and then fly back into Mexico without ever landing. And that poses a particular um, difficulty for us because obviously we cannot shoot them down out of the sky and we can apprehend them when they land and we can ap apprehend the drugs and that is why we're working on increased technology to help us to apprehend these individuals as they use ultralight aircraft. Back in Svalbard the weather is arguably some of the most challenging for air travel. In winter the runway needs to be cleared of snow almost continuously. When the airport here first opened in 1974, it was a life-changing occurrence for the local residents. They no longer felt cut off from the outside world, especially in the long, dark winter months. Commuting to the mainland was now possible in an hour and a half, making it easier to visit friends and family or stock up on luxury goods in the city. As soon as the sun starts to shed a little light on the island again, the first tourists arrive. Each year there are more, already up to 70,000 a year. The warm glow of the returning sun has a near magical effect on the people. It's a time for rejoicing, giving thanks for the light, and for welcoming newborns into the community. On Svalbard, christenings are a particularly special occasion. 
Each year, only around 30 children are born on the island. A candle is lit for little Lea Eva. Svalbard has only one church, and its congregation is the most northerly in the world. Lea Eva will grow up in an international community. Svalbard's residents today are from over 42 different countries. The vicar, for example, comes from Madagascar. And even outside the church, the return of the sun is celebrated with a week-long festival. It's the biggest social event in the Svalbard calendar, irrespective of the weather. For now, frost and ice are still the order of the day, and the thick covering of clouds lets through little of the promised sunlight. Despite the cold and dark winters, Svalbard attracts a surprising number of people from other countries who decide to make this remote island their home. Karolina Karas is from Poland, and she earns her living as an expedition and dog sledding guide, or sometimes on a cruise ship or on polar bear duty. Even though the sun doesn't provide a natural rhythm of day and night, she insists that it's important to maintain a daily routine here. Keeping busy and active is the best way to beat the winter blues. When Karolina first came here from Poland in 2003, she'd never traveled before and was not intending to stay long. My plan was to stay here for one winter. Uh, that's my ninth year now. So uh, that's the, the virus, the Svalbard virus. You come here for a day or for a vacation or for a winter and you stay here for years, basically. Carolina is not the only one to talk about the Svalbard virus. Many describe it as causing a strange yearning that seems incurable. Those that catch it fall under its spell and experience a longing or even a craving to return again and again. It may be the raw Arctic wilderness that captures people's imagination, or the small close-knit community where people are so dependent on one another. Or perhaps it's just that life is much more straightforward here without all the modern trappings. Uh, sometimes I miss trees. I miss the real summer with the t-shirt and short pants. Yeah, I think that's, that's what I miss the most. Carolina has traded in a world of trees and hot pants for one where resilience and strong nerves are needed. Here, her daily life is simple and revolves around the most basic of human needs. When she sets off on her sledge, all that matters is the safety of her dogs, the weather, and keeping a lookout for polar bears. But she's gained a life of adventure, true wilderness, and no boundaries.
It's March the 8th, the day the sun officially returns to Long Yebian. All the children in town head up the hill for the beginning of the Sun Festival. But the Sun Fest will have to start without its guest of honor. The blanket of clouds stubbornly refuses to lift and let in even the smallest ray of sunshine. But the people of Long Yebian are not easily put off. This is only the beginning of a week-long celebration of concerts, lectures, services and parties. Strålende! Ok, først og alt vil jeg ønske dere alle sammen velkommen til at vi skal feire skolen. Today they're celebrating not just the return of the sun, but also of their youngest council member, 18-year-old Vilja Hansen. Du skal flytte, ja. <laughs> Vilja was badly injured in the massacre on the Norwegian island of Utøya, where he survived being shot five times. He, more than anyone here, appreciates seeing the sun once again. And then it's time for a communal song, a polar gospel to welcome back the sun. In the valley of Viganella, a cover of cloud also threatens to dampen a special day. It's February the 2nd, and the first day that sunlight will reach the village square again. Here too, the arrival of the sun is celebrated, and preparations are in full swing. For centuries, this day has been marked with a special thanksgiving service and a religious procession. In the Catholic Church, it's Candlemas Day and signifies the end of the Christmas season. At the center of festivities is the large decorated Christmas tree, which has stood in the piazza for most of the winter. According to tradition, the local delicacies adorning the tree must now be auctioned for charity. It's a lively affair and the whole village joins in. Sausages, cheese and headscarves are on offer. For the residents of Viganella, the ingenious large mirror may have brought a shimmer of light into their dark winters. But nothing quite compares with the return of real sunshine and an end to the cold winter. That will always be a time for celebrating. Thousands of kilometers away in Quartzsite, Arizona, the sun is so relentless, it drives many into the shade. But whether living with permanent sunshine or continuous darkness, the people who cope with these extremes have one thing in common. Resilience and a positive attitude to life. Sunny all day, yeah. The eagle flies high on Friday. Saturday, I'm out to play. Come Sunday, go to church and then enjoy a sunny day all day. It's always sunny down here, it's hard to sing a stormy Monday blues. Hurry down! 
on sunshine Let's just see what tomorrow brings Hurry down sunshine Hey, let's see what tomorrow brings Yeah, I sometimes pray for rain Just for a change of things You know there's nothing like sunshine Help keep the blues away